Good morning, guys. Well, still dark, but it is morning, technically, because it's where's the clock? Coming up to one thirty in the morning. I didn't do a vlog before this, but I deleted it because it kind of dragged on for an hour, and I've really got to try to, you know, shorten my videos by a long shot. Because an hour of talking about random stuff, even to me, sounds like too much. So, as you can see, as we move on with the video, I've been a busy bee this evening. I've got the gaming station set up. Well, my little gaming station, anyway. Wouldn't mind a slightly bigger CRT TV in there, but... I think the chances of me actually finding a slightly bigger one now would be slim to none. Um, I've got the Mega Drive, it's all set up, it's just not plugged into the mains yet, I've got to sort the sockets out. As, uh, as you can see, I've got a big... You might not be able to see oh yeah, you can just about see it down there. I've got that extension reel, and... Uh, They do say that if you're going to use an extension reel, that you should unravel all the cable before using it. And because the cable can heat up and start a fire. Because there's no breathing space when it's wrapped around the um, reel. And if I was just running like a set of Christmas lights or the light on that, I wouldn't worry too much about it because there wouldn't be too much current draw. But uh, as I'm probably going to be running the TV, the amplifier, and one off the consoles, obviously, that's going to put a bit of strain on that cable, and it might get a bit too hot, so I'm going to just cut a length of cable off that, because I don't need the extension reel anyway, I might as well just use it as cable. And I've got an extension socket somewhere around here with no cable on it, because I was going to change change it for that black one, you know, swap them over. And I put that on the end, but that won't give me enough plug, so I'll have to plug that into it. And yes, you can plug two extension sockets together, but you can't exceed 13 amps on either one. if that makes sense. So I could plug that well like I've done up there, you know, I've got that three way socket on this end plugged into the black one. Which is fine, you can do that safely. That's not a problem. But uh you can't exceed thirty amps on this one, um thirteen amps. Nor should you exceed thirteen amps on this one. Um, I think there's a, a bit of discretion with the um, ampage rating. You probably could draw a few more amps over the 13 amp. But of course they're going to tell you that, so it's well within a safety limit, so it won't, you know, catch fire. But uh, that one portable TV and a console, and maybe the amplifier if I choose to use it, um, should be fine because it's not like I'm going to have all three consoles on I mean a console doesn't draw a lot of current that light in there won't draw a lot of, lot of current but I barely use that light anyway you know I probably won't use all three computers over there at the same time so it's fine to do it over there as well so you're probably asking why do I bother with a KVM switch, but well, that is because I can have three different machines set up and just turn whichever one on I want when I want to play with one. And that's why I did it that way. But the chances of all three being on at the same time are slim. Unless I'm, I don't know, showing a friend that comes around what it does. 
and I might turn all three on so I can switch between them. Uh, I did want to put a fourth down here, but I don't know where I'd put it. I think there's several places to put it, but... Right. So, moving on. Plans for tomorrow. Doesn't look like we'll be doing a car boot. Because Mum hasn't said anything. But uh, they've got other priorities anyway, so... But uh, hopefully, weather permitting, we'll do it Saturday. Um... I'll finish setting that up tomorrow. I've got a lady coming to look at that. As I'm not going out, I'm going to see if I can get her to come a bit earlier. So um, I thought I was going to be doing a car boot sale, so I said I won't be available until about 4pm. But as I'm not, I'm going to see if she wants to come around about lunchtime. If she wants the TV for a door, so I think it will sell. It'll be nice because it'll be an extra 20 odd quid in my pocket. I don't know if I'm letting it go too cheap or what. Because I've put it up for 25 quid. Or pounds, if you don't know the British slang for pounds. Um, because this doesn't have HDMI. It doesn't have built in free view. So it is quite a basic TV. You know, it's an LCD version of that over there, really, because there's no fancy smancy stuff on it. It's got your basic SCART ports. Um, it does have VGA, so I can use it as a monitor if I wanted to. Uh, it's got the RF socket on there, which is pretty much void now, because we don't have analog TV over here. That's all turned off. It's digital only. So, um... I didn't think I should charge too much for it, so I thought 25 quid was a fair price. It's a 27 inch Bush TV. Works absolutely fine, remote works fine. It's fine. <laughs> uh, see, that extension socket, as I was saying earlier, it's not overloaded at all because there's nothing turned on apart from the telephone. <laughs> See? That is it. The TV is plugged in, but turned off by the main switch. The fan is the other one that's plugged in, obviously, turned off. And even over here, all I've got is the computer, which is turned off at the socket, and so is it. Um, so is that. Speakers were turned on for some reason, but... They weren't turned on there, so they weren't using any current, you see, that's stone cold. That's why I can get away with uh, what I is plugging in without overloading it. You've got to plan ahead. A lot of people don't. And they used to plug loads and loads of things in. End up overheating the socket, and while they're out or while they're asleep, it catches fire. Um, so, it's more so with these older TVs, because they used to draw a heck of a lot of current. I don't know if they draw more than these LCDs, but I know they were quite a current hog back in the day, especially the bigger ones. You know, when people had one of them plugged into an extension socket and plus VCR and they had Sky TV, there was probably the Sky Box plugged into it. Uh, home theatre system, if they had that, would probably be, probably be plugged into it, you know. And without any thinking, oh, I may be overloading this. You see, I'd, because of my electrical background, I know from what sort of fuse would be in the plugs how close I am to overloading a 13 amp extension socket. So I don't need to sit there and do all the mathematics and whatnot and work it out. But like I said, there's probably a little bit of a discretion there with the amps. 
but uh, to make sure us public are safe they're going to set it lower than the maximum it can take physically take to um, keep us safe so I know these 13 amp sockets would probably be able to handle a fair bit more than 13 amps but as I said to keep us safe they set it the maximum lower set the maximum rating lower for you know for us to follow so we uh, keep safe which I've probably said several times now it's late I'm getting tired uh, what else have I got to do tomorrow finish setting that up found the cable that I need which is basically a scar plug into um, RCA connectors uh, I need to plug the scar socket in the back of the VCR and then the um, RCA connectors onto the RCA jacks in the back of the PC. And uh, with the program that's pre-installed on there, I'll be able to watch videotapes through the PC. I can even record them to the PC and put them to DVD if I really wanted to, because I've got DVD up there. I could do that with all of those, actually that whole lot and then I wouldn't have to um, keep those videotapes and that isn't against copyright because you're only transferring the media you're not copying it to sell it so you can actually do that because um, I even see some shop there's a shop in town that advertise that they'll do that they'll put video to DVD. Well, unless the laws change, but that's what it was last time I knew. Well, that would just get rid of my um, videotape collection now, and I could have a bunch of DVDs. But, uh, speaking of DVD, I'm going to set that DVD player up over there. I'll put the VCR on top of it, but I will need, I think, might, I might not actually, may need another one of those. I'll check the ports on the back, actually. So if I've got RCA out on the back of that DVD player, I can just use an RCA cable. Because that's got um, RCA ports front and back, and you can select front and rear ports on the actual um, program. Which is handy. Uh, or I could just uh, keep the tapes. Because there's a lot there and it would take quite a while to get through that lot. So uh, I might do one or two just to experiment to see how easy it is. You know? Because I've got a stack of DVDs up there so I could easily do it. But uh, I don't think I'll do the whole lot. That's not worth it. You know, I've got VCR there. I've got VCR in the bedroom. Well, actually, the unit in the bedroom is a VCR-DVD combo that a friend of mine gave me. And uh, I've actually got a DVD in the car boot pile of stuff. Uh, there's a black DVD player under the bed. There's a black video player. Two black video players under the bed. And a silver video player under the bed. <laughs> so, I'm not sure on those sort of gadgets and gizmos. I only really kept them for um, spares. Not just for me, but uh, if one of my, you know, one of my relatives or friends had one die, then I can say, yeah, I've got one here, I'll have it. Because, um, well, actually, the funny thing is, I know that even today you can still sell an old VCR. Not for a lot, but uh, I know there's still people out there that still use them. So, uh, if they do pack up, you should be able to sell them. I haven't seen any at car boot sales. DVD players, which is why I've put like £2 on the one I've got, the car 
or got four of the car boot sale. My sister's got one there as well. Um, Okay, we've got nearly 15 minutes. I think half an hour videos are good. They're not too long, they're not too short. Uh, I plan to do a video on this in the future. Uh, just in case you're wondering, it's a CCTV cam. Uh, I've got the satellite receiver to put in the bedroom to swap it for the free sat box I've got in there. Uh, find a home for the laptops. I'm not sure where I'm going to put them. I suppose I could stack them up beside the uh, cabinet in that corner there. They'd be out of the way there. I don't really want to put, want to put them in front of the uh, videos and DVDs. And I've got a few here that I don't want. I'll put in the top box to go to the car boot. Uh, and uh, anything else I can think of to go to the car boot. There's a charity shop selling glasses at 10 pence each. And you know, it's very tempt tempting to walk in there, buy a load of the glasses at 10 pence each, take them to the car boot and sell them at, I don't know, 20, 30 pence each. But I'm not that snide. And I wouldn't, you know, cheat a charity out of money like that. If I bought them, I don't know, at a car boot sale or something at 10 pence, then yeah, that would be different. Still cheating someone out of money, but if that's what they want to sell them for at a car boot, it's up to them. But uh, there are traders at car boot sales that will do that anyway. Because, uh, when you first turn up that car boot sale in Britain, um, I, I don't know how it works at every car boot sale, but the ones around here, which are ran, um, two of them are ran by the same person, as I've said before, and he'll direct you in where he wants you to park your car, you know, assign you a pitch, basically, and, uh, Um, you can either set up straight away or you can wait until 10.30. I can't remember what time he opens for sellers. I think it's about 7 in the morning he opens up for sellers. Uh, and the actual car boots open to customers at 11. And uh, believe me, when me and Mum have arrived at like quarter past 8, 8.30 in the morning, there's quite a few people already there. Um, so you get your spot. You want to set your stuff up. Like I said, you can either do it as soon as you get there, or some people don't. They will just park up and just wander around or sit in the car or something until 10.30, because at 10.30, the only reason he allows you to get up and go walking around is if you need to go for a piss or you want a cup of coffee from the refreshment stand or a burger or something um, which sounds weird but it's actually down to the local council those rules that's why he has to open to, to the um, customers at 11 o'clock on the dot because me and mum found that out Monday when we were there. That's the reason why he's um, so strict. Because it is down to the council. Anyway. Before 10.30, you're free to wander around the car boot and you can buy from other stalls or whatever you want to do or chat to the other stall holders. But uh, what the regular car booters do, or the traders, whatever you want to call them, dealers, they will actually see what they can get cheap off other stalls and then put it on their stall at a slightly higher price. <laughs> <laughs> that 
they've done it to us but I personally don't care because it's something off my chest and I've got the prize I wanted for it so you know I'm not a greedy person you know when I go to these car boots if I make 20 quid I make 20 quid I'm not fussed I've still made money that's good enough to me I'm just not one of these people that want to make as much money as they can and then get pissed off because it's not the amount they wanted. <clears throat> you know, as long as I make something then that's great. That's successful to me. Well, back up a bit. Let's see if I can get to the PK. Did I take my evening pill? Yeah, I did take my evening pill. What's the most unreliable car you have ever owned? So I'm, I'm reading a question that someone's put on Facebook. Hmm. Well, I've never owned a car. But I think the most unreliable car my sister has owned is a tough competition between the Peugeot 206 and the Ford Puma. Both of them were heaps of shit. I think, though, I hated the Ford Puma more. Because it was just an unreli unreliable, uncomfortable, tiny piece of crap. <laughs> Maybe not all Pumas were like, are like that, but the Ford Puma my sister had was, and the Peugeot 206 she had was. That was born to bits. Horrible thing. Uh, I don't know. I suppose actually the worst car, or one of the worst cars my mum's ever owned, would have to be the Audi 80 she had. That seemed to be allergic to water. Go through even a thimbleful, you know, dinky little puddle you could splash through, and that would make the engine cough and splatter until it's burn off that water and then it'll be fine. And if you actually go through a too deep a puddle, it did actually conk out on you. Until the water had sort of, I don't know, drained off of whatever it had covered to cause it. And then it would start up again. And that was really, really horrible. And apparently I'd heard that was quite a trait for the ADA. I don't know if that's true. Um... But I think that's got to be the worst. Now, if you were to ask me what was the best car Mum's ever owned, that's a tough one. Because she's... There's been several favourites over the years. The Toyota Carina, which was a 1996 model, that was a very decent car. Yeah, it was over 10 years old when she had it. But everything still worked perfectly on it. There was no rust. There was no rot. There was nothing leaking. So despite being this age, it was still a top car. It still rode beautifully. The only shame was it got written off in a head-on collision. <laughs> oh dear. Poor thing. Yeah, Mum was fine. She suffered a foot injury but that was it um, I think that was classed as a 50-50 at fault that one because it was on a country road and as they were both coming up to a blind bend and um, mum would have, wouldn't have been going too fast because just beyond the blind bend um, in the direction she was facing was the junction and this other car had obviously just come in to the junction and thought he could put his foot down, you know, country road. He probably didn't expect anyone to be round the corner. But unfortunately, Mum was round the corner and they met. So that was a sad end to the, to the uh, Toyota Carina, unfortunately. And the other unfortunately with that Carina was it was a rare CDX. 
but uh, that was one of the best cars. Um, I'm just trying to think. The two litre Rover 25 diesel she had. Yeah, it sounded like a tank because there was a rattle coming from one of the um, idler pulleys because it sheared two of the bolts off for the idler pulley, so it was only held on by one. And I've got a feeling the bearings were actually gone as well, so... But we managed to bodge it back on with one, because it did shear off completely and fall off while Mum was filling up with petrol, so... <laughs> My stepdad, bless him, had to drive the damn thing eight miles with um, no power steering or anything, because obviously the idler pulley ran all the pumps and whatnot, so he had no power steering pump. Um, I chewed all the belt as well when I threw that pulley off, but he managed to bodge the pulley back on. Although the odd thing is, if you took a glass or a jug of water, poured it over that idler pulley, it would stop rattling. So it never rattled when it was raining. But um, that car was an absolute tank or at least the engine was, you couldn't kill it. Um, I don't know if I've mentioned or talked about it before, but Mum drove the car into a flood, forgetting to keep her revs up high so no water got sucked into the engine. But uh, it did, and it hydrolocked the engine. And uh, Mum was convinced she'd killed the car because of that. But me and my stepdad were out there, and we spent a good three hours out there taking the injectors out and pumping all the water out of it, and she ran again. <laughs> um, then it developed an issue where sometimes it would just lose power, and then it would gain power, then it would lose power, then it would gain power, and then another time that would be fine. And all I did was literally take the fuel filter off, empty it out, give it a quick clean out, put it back on, use the primer bulb that's on the fuel line to refill the um, fuel filter and away it went. Never get, gave us any trouble after that either. So, yeah, I think that's got to be up there with Mum's best cars. Uh, I think her current one, the Mitsubishi Pajero pin-in, there's a slight sort of, well I'm not actually sure if it's a tap or a click that's coming from the engine when it's running. But it's not affecting the um, performance or anything. It's just annoying. <laughs> it's just an annoying sound. But apart from that, it does ride fine. Again, it's an old X-Reg, which would make that 1998 model, I think. Possibly 1999. So it's got some age to it, but the thing is mint. In fact, I've only found a little bit of rust under the bonnet. That is it. I don't think there's any underneath. I haven't actually had a look, but again, everything is working as it should. Then again, it's Japanese. Japanese build their cars to last. Um, I can't comment on any American car because I've never owned one. I've never been in one. And I've never known any friends in this country to... um own one. Obviously I've got lots of American friends online so they drive them but there does seem to be quite a split between Dodge, Chevy and Ford over there. Um, Fords get a lot of slack over here or a lot of flack I should say, not slack because um, they tend to be cheap that's how I'd describe a Ford over here. They're a budget car. Well, no, actually, I won't call them a budget car. They're sort of between budget car and your expensive brand. You know, they sort of sit somewhere in the middle. Same as Vauxhall over here would. And Peugeot and Citroën, Renault. Uh, Nope, my head's gone blank now. I can't think of any more. <laughs> um, Mitsubishi, Nissan, 
Volvo, all of those over here would be your sort of middle class, I suppose you could call them. But Ford seemed to be one of the worst. Although between Ford van, Ford vans, Ford fans and Vauxhall fans, they do seem to be quite a uh, what what would you call it? A lot of piss taking out of each owner. Because you look, you know. You'll always get the hardcore fans of any type of car out there, really. Vauxhall, Ford, Dodge, Chevy, Mitsubishi, Subaru, you know. You get your die-hard fans of each. Think if I was going to be a die-hard fan of any manufacturer, <laughs> the voice is getting dry. <clears throat> it would be Japanese cars and it would be Mitsubishi. Um, my dad's had one Mitsubishi, he's had a Pajero, my mum's on a second one, the first one, I can't remember what the hell it was now, it was a bloody lovely car, the only thing that went on it was the gearbox, but you know, that's a general wear and tear item, so, uh, but it didn't go or wasn't that long that it died after she got the car from the dealer, the second hand car dealer, so she actually did a pass exchange with the um, diesel Rover 25 that she tried to kill several times and failed. <laughs> but yeah, apart from the gearbox going, that was a bloody lovely reliable car. Uncomfortable. I think just about every Japanese car I've been in has been comfortable and reliable. Uh, Mum's had a Nissan Almera Tino, which is a bit like a people carrier thingy. That was nice. Uh, but I'm not biased. When it comes to American cars, I would be a die-hard Ford Mustang fan. Love them. And the Dodge Chargers, including the new ones. So, you know, I'm not biased. Not really. But uh, if I consider a type of car to be a piece of shit, I'll tell you. Um, I don't like Peugeot. That's the only French car I don't like. Because... Um, my family's had experiences with more than one Peugeot and I could have quite cheerfully put them in the taken them to the middle of a field and set the bastards on fire. I had one Mum had was a Peugeot I think it was an eight oh six people carrier thing. Uh, and a, a mobiliser on it was a pain in the frickin' arse. You would just have, you had to um, put the key in, turn it, dial a code in on the keypad, and then the car should start. Did it bollocks. Sometimes that worked, and other times it won't. Sometimes you had to pop the hood and press some sort of reset friggin' button or something. And uh, sometimes, no matter how many times you hit the reset button, it wouldn't, still wouldn't work. So you just lock it all up, leave it, walk away, come back half an hour later and redo it, and that'll work. But uh, that's such a pain in the ass. <clears throat> so, a couple of bad experiences with Peugeot, so I really don't like them. Um, we've had Renault. Had a Renault Megane Scenic. Again, that was another people carrier vehicle on M. Is it an MPV? I think they'd be classed as multiple people vehicle or whatever it is, mul multiple passenger vehicle. I can't remember what MPV stands. I think it'd be classed as an MPV. Um, but that was all right. That was pretty comfortable, pretty nippy. I think that was a diesel as well. Um, so that developed a rattle under the engine, which turned out to be an idler pulley as well. 
wasn't the alternator because me and my stepdad changed that and it still did it. But uh, it was coming from that side where the um, belts that ran the alternator and all the pumps were. So my guess is now it would have been an idle pulley which would have been expensive to replace. So Mum just got rid of it in the end. Uh, then she got a Ford Focus Estate. Horrible freaking cars they are as well. Didn't like it. In fact, I think only three, yeah, only three doors actually opened on that one. One was stuck shut. <laughs> that had odd-looking headlights, because it obviously had a prank on the front end, and they'd replaced the headlight. But instead of replacing the other one, so they had a nice clean pair, they still had the faded one on the left. Uh, yeah. I'm not a lover of Ford Focus either. Yeah, they look nice. I do like the newer ones. This one was quite an old one as well, so... The newer versions of it, hopefully, are better. Um, I don't like Ford Mondeos either. Well, I don't like the Mark, the first ones, the Mark 1s. I'm not keen on the Mark 2s. I think if I was going to go for a Mondeo, it would be the Mark 3 onwards. Uh, I think what else Mum's had? So the Volkswagen Passat estate. That weren't too bad. She's had several Volvos. Well, Volvo is just a tank anyway. She's had... Well, when, when my mum and dad were together and I was little, one of the common cars they had was a Vauxhall Carlton. So, when it comes to Vauxhalls, I love the Carlton. And the Cavalier, actually. I know they do a Chevy Cavalier, but they're not the same. Vauxhall Cavalier over here was different. I think. Unless one was based on the other. I don't know the history behind that. <coughs> I'd have to look it up. Uh, but yeah. We had Mark I Carlton's. We had Mark II Carlton's. And we had the GSI 3000 as well. That was a lovely one. But it turned out to be rotten as a pear underneath. To the point that the MOT tester wouldn't let Mum drive at home. Not with the kids in anyway. A.K.A. me and my brother. Which is a shame, because I loved that car. And now the rare is rock and roll shit. There weren't many of them made, and there weren't many of the Lotus Carlton made either. So, uh, yeah, Carlton's for Vauxhall and Cavaliers. Hate courses. Not because that's what, you know, the Chavy Boy racers over here choose to drive. I just don't like the look of them, especially the Mark 1s. Just, to me, they're just ugly little cars. And I've ridden in them, several, and I've... To me, they feel horrible to ride in as well. So, courses. Oh. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to let the video go on any longer. It's just over half an hour now, so... Uh, I'm not going to do any of that looking, you know, thumbs up, like, thumbs down, you know. I'm not going to do any of that anymore, because I think you all know, after all these years, what to do with the like buttons anyway. So, uh, well, you can do what you like with the like buttons. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all I'm going to say is, thank you for watching, and uh, I'll talk to you again in the next video. Bye.